All right, here we are. One of my favorite times of the day is when I get to sit here with Captain Marty and hear another one of his stories. Marty, what are you going to tell us today? Justin, today we're going to take a walk down memory lane to my boyhood home of Ponsonlet, Florida. And I'm going to tell you about one of my very first trips that I spent the night in the ocean and a scary thing that happened as a 15-year-old. I'll be back to do that in just a moment. Hi, I'm LB Daniels, and when you want great local seafood, you go to Fresh Cat's Seafood and Wan Cheese. How do I know it's great? My daddy is one of the fishermen that brings it to the docks. At Fresh Cat's Seafood, you will get local seafood right from their fish house. They are a family-owned business that knows the name of every fisherman that comes to their docks. Visit their social media pages to see the latest catches. My daddy would love to put his tuna on your dinner plate, so get it now from Fresh Catch Seafood and Wan Cheese. Boasting phenomenal seafood dishes, a great menu, and waterfront views with deck seating, Striper's Bar and Grill at the Shallowbag Bay Marina in Manio serves a casual, fun-filled dining experience with an Outer Banks flair. With three floors to choose from, you're bound to find the perfect seat for you and yours while enjoying great food and fantastic drinks. To see our menu and to catch a glimpse of the beautiful views, go online to stripersbarandgrill.com. Striper's Bar and Grill at the Shallowbag Bay Marina in Manio, where everyone's a VIP. A lot of people that know me know that Ponce Inlet is at the very south end of Daytona Beach. The house I grew up in was at the, about 100 yards from the old south turn of the old beach course in Daytona when they used, NASCAR used to race on the beach. It was at the foot of the second tallest lighthouse on the east coast behind Hatteras Lighthouse. And uh, it was a, a dream. But you would have loved it. Justin, it was like a dream place to grow up. I've seen photographs of yeah. it from back in that time. Just, so you had the the beach, a, a block out one door, the intercoastal and the charter boat fleet a block out the other door, and the inlet a block to the south. It's a neat place to grow up. And 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 when I grew up around the docks, we used to get kids. You know what a wharf rat is from Wanchies. I've you'd heard go, that term a time or two. You'd hang around the docks. You'd do odd jobs, usually grunt-type labor. We'd scrub the headboats, I remember, for two bucks a day. And that was a fortune. It seemed like a lot of money. You could play a lot of pinball <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the only <laughs> pinball machine that they had in the little in Timmins Fish Camp, you know. So anyway, a lot of our listeners have been there for the races. I know my background. Well, Captain Jake Stone had a boat called the Flamingo, not a big headboat. But it was like a 55-footer. It carried like 35 people. And he was retired Navy commander, <clears throat> big guy, six feet five, ball-headed. Um, when he got upset, which was often in a really short temper, his whole head would turn red like a glow plug. Oh, Lord. It was just like when you saw them blood vessels turning red, you knew, like, give him some distance. But he was really good. He was known as the Dean of Skippers. He pulled more people out of that inlet, which was a very dangerous inlet, Ponce Inlet was. And so I had been around there. I used to catch live bait as a kid. And like he would, we'd put the live pinfish on the boat for his groups. And if the boat wasn't full, we would get a chance to go out as and fish, you know, uh, for free. And uh, it, was, it was neat. And so by the time I got in high school, I actually became the second mate on the boat. I started as a bait boy uh, in middle school and then moved up when I was a 10th grader. I actually got to spend the summer as the second mate behind George Francis, the first mate. Of course, Jake was the captain. Well, when business got slow in the summer, and it sometimes did, you know, if we had a three or four day stretch with not enough people to go headboat fishing, and by the way, this was during the heyday of snapper and grouper fishing. And in this series, I will tell you other stories about <clears throat> some of the things I saw in that period. But we would, we could convert that boat from a headboat to what you would call a bottom fishing commercial boat uh, with one arm bandits and going for your snappers and groupers like we have people that do here out of Hatteras and out of Juan Cheese. Right. Uh, and man, it was it was neat. So on the very first trip, uh, Jake said, now he cleared it with my mom. It was okay. We're going to be gone for, we're going to leave on Monday and come back on Friday so we can switch it back over for head boat fishing on the weekend. I'm like, we're going to stay out there for four days? He's like, yeah, you ever done that? I'm like, no, I'm 15 years old. So we we hung some bunks. We He had, uh, I don't know how to, a, a metal frame canvas bunk. He could hang four of them underneath the awning on that boat. And then there was the engine box, which is where I slept. And uh, it was kind of like an open canopy type okay, thing, like right. those headboats have, you yep. know? 
the Florida style headboats. And then we put a big kill box on there and we put those six electric reels, one arm bandits there. They were mounted. We had a quick way of putting three on each side of the boat. And mine was the middle one on the starboard side. So I was totally excited and the weather was good, which, you know, I, I'd never been in the ocean at night before. We got out there on the first, we got out there about noon by the time we got out on the first day, had a good bite, caught some fish. He was happy. Uh, Jake, you know, he was a great fisherman, really gifted fisherman. And um, he'd done it all. He'd run shrimp boats and done every kind of commercial fishing and the head boats. And don't forget, he was a Navy commander. So he gave orders pretty quickly. Got it. I had a total respect for him. He also liked peach flavored brandy, Ooh. which he would sip on most every day. Okay. <laughs> okay. That that nowadays would be frowned on a little bit. But uh, back in, remember, we're going all the way back to 1973, 72. So we get out there and we, and, and at the end of the fish, I didn't know, do we fish at night? What do we do at night? He said, no, we had our, we had a good fishing during the day. We're going to anchor up and we're going to chill out. He was kind of like happy. We, so the crew, there's six of us, or well, five other than him, we cleaned the boat up, sprayed, washed everything, and gutted down. We took our snappers and groupers and gutted. Then we had to pack them all in the big kill box in ice. And then Jake went in shore a little bit to like 90 feet of water and had us drop the anchor. So we dropped the anchor. We let out a couple hundred feet of extra line so we can lay on the anchor. And it was really neat. It was sunset, calm. I'm out there with the Dean of Skippers, you know, pretty neat. That is. So, only one motor in the boat. He cuts the motor off, and that made me a little nervous because we only have one motor, you know. But he was confident it would start up again in the morning. And so we had a really, some kind of really, I think we fried up some grouper. It was something really good. Ooh. Because we, we grubbed up, when we went grocery shopping, we bought really good food. Of course. It's what you do. That's what you do. Yeah. And, and that's true in Wanchi's on those yeah, frogs. Yeah. They eat good. Oh, they dang sure do. So after we ate and got settled in, kind of water, there was no no shower on the boat or anything like that. We didn't care. Uh, so we all, everybody cl- crawled into their bunks and there was roll down canopies on both sides. If you had bad weather or rain, you could have rolled them down to get out of the weather. But it was a pretty night, so we left them up. And so we're just underneath the hard top, this long canopy of this boat. So Jake and, the, and George Francis, the first man, are in the top bunks. The two deadheads we had, or three, were in the other one, and I'm on the engine box, which was fine. It was still warm, too, you know, from the day. So I'm laying there, and we're, and Jake is telling us all these old stories from the good old days of Ponce Hamlet and rescuing his nephew off the, uh, off a boat that he had come across the bar and capsized, and people drowned, and he saved two or three of them, and like I said, there are a lot more stories about Poncelin, but I couldn't believe I had the good fortune to be laying there in a bunk listening to this man tell stories after a good day of fishing. So we're just laying there talking. You could see out from under that canopy. All of a sudden, we look up in the sky, and there's a big glow way up high in the sky, and it's coming down slowly. We're like, what is it? It's a ball of fire coming down, and we're about 45 miles northeast of Daytona Beach out okay. there in no man's land between St. Augustine and Daytona, you know. And we're out there. Sure enough, Jake says, what in the devil is that? And everybody jumps out of their bunk, and we run over to the side of the boat, and we're looking at that. And it's, it's obviously something coming down on fire out of the sky. So what's it going to be? It's going to be a plane. More than likely. Likely, yeah. yeah. I was so, thinking it might have been a meteor or something. So Jake no. being the old, yeah, but it was coming too slow to be a meteor. It was uh, just coming down very slow, straight down, though. And, okay. and it was probably a mile away, but we're laying on an anchor. We can't just crank up the motor and go without cutting the anchor line. He wasn't going to do that. So he starts being coming Navy commander again, and he's like giving orders. Get the anchor buoy. And when you pull an anchor, you attach a big poly ball or float to it, and, and then the captain circles the boat around and that ball will slide down the line and it'll pull the anchor loose and the anchor will float to the surface 200 feet behind the boat and then the crew gets up there and pulls it in by hand. That's the way we did it then for deep water and a lot. we had a lot of anchor line up. Jake cranks up the boat and it started and he is shouting orders, get that anchor, get that buoy and we're all, I'm just a kid. This is my first night in the ocean. But everybody else snapped to duty 
and they're pulling the anchor in, and I'm watching that ball of fire, and it's coming down. And finally, you can tell it hit the water, you know, that, but it's still burning. It's still a ball of fire. And Jake had that, that old 871 diesel cranked up. And when we pulled the anchor over the side, he took off. And he said, keep your eye on that. Now, remember, before plotters, before anything, he had a compass and a Loran A, but we were going to the fire. So it's a mile away. And the boat was not fast. So he's like, get life jackets. Get, he's still, he's back in Navy commander role. Anyway, we, we get there and right as we're approaching it, the fire goes out. Whatever it was, sank. But we were so close that we could A, smell it. B, there was smoke all over the water. And when we pulled up there. All right, pause right there, Marty. When we come back, we'll find out what Marty saw when they pulled up. Are you ready for a fishing thrill like no other? Oh, there he is! There he is! Oh, got him up! As seen on Wicked Tune and Outer Banks, the Carolina Girl, captained by majestic Jesse Anderson, is a custom, luxurious, 53-foot Jarrett Bay-built boat running out of Hatteras Harbor Marina. Let Jesse and her crew give you a fishing experience of a lifetime. Woo! Book a trip, go online to carolinagirlsportfishing.com. Carolina Girl Sport Fishing, your offshore adventure awaits. <laughs> debris all over the surface of the water little pieces though not big pieces and there was a, a the tail of an airplane like just just the tail nothing else um and you can talk about shaking up a 15 year old kid so we sat there and there was nothing to do whatever had happened that plane had gone caught on fire up in the sky had gone down on, on fire and there was nobody to rescue nothing like that so we called the coast guard course as is often the case with the coast guard even back in those days can't leave the site so jake took put the loran numbers down and we threw one of our buoys which we always had ready for snapper and grouper fishing if we met a good mark we'd throw the buoy. we threw the jug and we had to wait there till daylight and the coast guard came out picked up some debris and things like that and we went about the next day we went about three more days of fishing we had a, it was, turned out to be a really good trip but that put a damper on things well about a week later, they put divers. The Coast Guard brought professional divers, and and they got out there and they found some more of the plane on the bottom um, with the deceased pilot. What it was, and no, because there was no flight record. Nobody had any idea who, until they could get a number off of the plane. But what it was, it was a drug runner from Cuba or somewhere, and he was flying up the coast that night by himself. There was one person in the plane. Nobody knew. Uh, he was there and his plane caught fire and he went down. He could, there was nothing he could do. He, the plane went down and they did, it was loaded with marijuana. The oh, plane was, lo- what, what was left of the plane was loaded with marijuana. So that was an experience I'll never forget that night. Um, and the rest of the trip, I, I had a hard time sleeping because I was always had one eye looking up to see what's going to come burning out of the sky. Anyway, it's a story and it's a great memory. 